Hello, everybody. Indeed, today I'm here to tell you about cyber hygiene and how it can help you and how it can save your business from cyber attacks. This is a very practical workshop. Um, we will do fun stuff here, and we're going to have fun. But before that, of course, we need to have um, an intro. Well, a bit about myself. Um, my name is Kirill Solovios. I have a, a degree, master's degree. I hold a couple of certificates in hacking, certified ethical hacking, uh, the cybersecurity certificate for, from CompTIA. I'm the owner and lead researcher at Possible Security. It's an IT security company, quite a small one here in Latvia. I've been working in cybersecurity for uh, more than 10 years. And I do love to talk about security issues, and that's what we can do today. We will spend most of the presentation talking about Wi-Fi. I mean, in, in 14 minutes, we can't really cover everything, all the aspects. But Wi-Fi is something we use daily, especially when traveling, at home. Me, myself, I actually didn't have any Wi-Fi at all at home. I just didn't need it. I, I had this long cable going to every laptop in my house. It was about 10 years ago. And then I bought this device here. And I couldn't plug the cable in, so I had to set up a Wi-Fi. And I started looking into Wi-Fi security. Um, and well, it's not good. <laughs> we'll, we'll, we'll see. It's dangerous. At the end of the presentation, we will also talk about how can you protect our, yourselves and the company you work for. And we are not only going to talk about Wi-Fi, we're going to talk about some general cybersecurity tips that will help you and your company if you observe, observe the cyber hygiene tips. So Wi-Fi, what are the challenges? What's the problem with Wi-Fi? Well, first of all, do we, have, do we have any technical people in the room? Because this is a people's conference, right? And it's about people. But do we have any? No. All, all people people. OK, well, Wi-Fi is basically a radio, right? You, do you remember listening to those 15 years ago? Maybe you still do that in your car today. Radio signals penetrate walls, well, most of them. And that's an important thing to understand. Wi-Fi does not end at the external wall of your office. Wi-Fi actually continues on through to the parking lot, to the neighboring buildings, and maybe even further. So the only way to protect information that we have on Wi-Fi is encryption. We have to use a code to mangle the contents so that bad guys aren't able to see what we're doing or affect what we're doing. Unfortunately, encryption is really hard. Good encryption is hard. It's almost as hard as artificial intelligence. Maybe not quite, but it's not easy to create good encryption. Another challenge that Wi-Fi faces is lack of updates. How many of you have updated, um, updated the apps on your phone recently? 90%. How many of you have ever updated your home Wi-Fi router? OK, 20%. So we have some people. Thank you very much, gentlemen. That's, that's great. Updating physical devices is, is, is hard. You have to put effort into it. And it's a challenge for Wi-Fi devices. And finally, insecure passwords. It's important. How will we will see today, it's very important to use a really good password for a Wi-Fi. Otherwise, if you don't have a good password, well, you're going to get hacked. Um, another thing that's important, have you actually changed your password when the box was installed in your home back, back whenever? Or are you still using the same password? So those are just some of the challenges that we are facing when using a Wi-Fi. So how safe is the Wi-Fi? This, uh, this is schematic from attacker's perspective. So a bad guy comes to your house or to your company and wants to hack your Wi-Fi. So they, they arrive, and they immediately have one of three choices. The Wi-Fi has no password, like the one here in this conference, for example. Or the Wi-Fi has an unknown password, where attacker is unable to find out what the password is. Or it's a known password, 
Do you know any examples of when Wi-Fi has a password, but it is a known password? Hotels, coffee shops, some conferences. Anyone going into the menu can actually ask for a password and get it. That's the known password. Well, attackers, if they get into the network, if they have no password or they type in the password, then they can proceed to attack you. They are on the same network, and they can do different funny things with your data connection, with your phone, with your laptop, with your security. Um, unfortunately, this part is not um, what we are talking here about today. So I'm not going to be showing much, much here. But what else can happen? Maybe it's an unknown password, and an attacker cannot get it. And uh, those of you who have updated the routers probably have seen these, um, these uh, bunches of letters in settings. Many of you probably have heard about them. Well, those are the ways to encrypt your Wi-Fi. Historically, we started with uh, web, and then we, we went forward down. Well, depending on how you have decided to secure your Wi-Fi, attacker can crack the password using automated tools in two seconds, in a couple hours. Or if you use WPA2, it all really comes down to the password you use. I'm assuming that you have updated all the devices, of course. If you haven't, then even WPA2 will not help you. For example, some of you may have Android phones. If you have not updated your Android phones this year, then whatever password you have will not help you. Because attacker can actually make sure that your phone turns off the encryption even when using WPA2. It's a bug that was, was discovered uh, in January this year. So updating devices is important. And then, of course, after cracking the network, attacker can proceed to further attacks. If you have a good password and everything is updated, then you're probably safe. So for this event, I gathered some st statistics about encryption of wireless networks. Right. So we have um, WPA2 here, which is relatively secure. WPA, which is almost secure-ish. Uh, WEP, which has been cracked so much that we can actually break it in two seconds. And we have networks without any encryption. So here, here are the stats for the world. 77% of the networks monitored online uh, in the world use the best encryption currently available. And it's still not super good. There, there are still some problems. And that's why community is working on WPA3. And only. 23% actually use something else, including 6% unencrypted. Well, let's take a look at all the countries here. So these are some of the countries of um, Elka Group partners. And uh, we can, for example, let's start with Latvia, right? It's right here where we are right now. Um, the situation for Latvia actually hasn't changed much in the past year. I did this uh, a year ago, and it was almost exactly the same. If we look at the black bars here, actually, what are those mainly? Those are mainly public access points. Because uh, as a society, we, we probably uh, are aware enough of the need to have an encryption. In some countries, it's even illegal not to have an encrypted Wi-Fi. Because if some attacker would connect to it and would do bad things online, you would be the one responsible for that. Well, we can, uh, for example, take a look at uh, Czech Republic, which has only 39% WPA2 or United States, which has only 38% um, WPA2. We see that uh, the best situation is actually in Ukraine, which is good, good for them. So those are the stats on encryption. Not all of us are, use, are using WPA2. <laughs> but to make it interesting, I will still be attacking WPA2 today, because attacking the normal, the old standards is too easy. So let's say you have traveled abroad. And uh, it's expensive to use mobile internet, or your provider doesn't provide mobile internet. Right? You travel to a non-EU country, or you come from a non-EU country to Latvia. And then you find the free Wi-Fi in a coffee shop, in a hotel. And of course, it's an opportunity to get some work done. So that's what we're going to be looking at right now. Um, this computer here. is your computer. You open up the web browser.
right here, and uh, you can start browsing the web. For example, some news, right? You're doing your work. You are maybe reading your emails, maybe writing some comments online. Oh, it's a bit slow, but it's uh, slowly loading. So this here is attacker's computer, and you can see the screen over there. Meanwhile, attacker knows that someone is going to use that network. Someone's going to connect there. And let's assume attacker can't get the password, can't ask. It's, it's a private coffee shop. Only people who actually uh, come there every day get the Wi-Fi password. No one else can. So attacker, you, you of course think, oh, that's cool. I'm secure. It's a private coffee shop. No, no random people can come in and get the password. Well, attacker can still try to get to your password. Let me show you how. Let me actually open something smaller. I think uh, this is taking a bit too, too long to load. OK, yeah. It's loading over there. This page is uh, much smaller. So, OK, great, great. So, attacker will, of course, try to see what's happening. Remember, Wi-Fi is just radio waves. So attacker will start to, start to monitor the radio waves around them. Sorry about that. I tested this demo four times, and now is the time we have a small glitch. Let me just uh... well. Sometimes attackers have uh, problems, but then again, you're at the coffee shop for a long time, probably, so they are able to connect to your network. OK, so my suggestion here is um, let's move this demo to the end of the presentation. I think I need to reboot the computer, just in case. And we will continue with the presentation right now. Sorry about that, but don't go away. The demo is going to be fun. Right. So. What can you, as an individual, do to actually avert the risks provided by Wi-Fi attacks? You can adhere to some principles that are called cyber hygiene. It's not a new concept, but it's a rehashed name. It's a new, new buzzword. Cyber hygiene means that you or your company establish some rules for how you will act when you use a computer, like washing your hands before you eat. There are some daily things that you need to do before using a computer. And there are some things that you need to do every month. For example, check that your antivirus is still running. And we're going to go through those tips here. And I hope you will be able to learn from that. So the first tip. And it's specifically to fix the Wi-Fi problem that we will see in a moment, is use a virtual private network. You have heard about them, probably. In, in uh, non-democratic countries, in totalitarian regimes, those are often used to circumvent censorship. What the name means is simply you can virtually connect to a different network outside of where you are. What it means for an attacker is that attacker cannot see the data that you're sending because they are encrypting, because you are encrypting your data before it's being sent to the attacker. And remember that even though we will be looking at a Wi-Fi attack, mobile internet isn't safe as well. Mobile internet also has a similar problem. Of course, the attack is a bit more sophisticated. But still, it's not exactly the safest place to be. So whenever I'm abroad or whenever I'm using a public Wi-Fi, I always use virtual private network. I connect to a server and get my stuff encrypted. 
Okay, I think we're ready to proceed with the demo here. Yep, okay. Right, so you have connected the internet, you're browsing the, the web, right? And the attacker tries to take a look at what's happening around you on the network. Attacker will start to listen in on what's happening around you. Will start to look at all the packets that are coming in. They will use a special Wi-Fi driver to create a special mode on their computer. And then they will be immediately able to see everything that's happening around them. Like this. For example, here we can see attacker sees all the Wi-Fi networks that are available here. If I wanted to, at this moment, I would be able to just launch a program and see what's happening in the Elko conference network. But I'm not going to do that for that network, of course, uh, for legal reasons. But all unencrypted networks are visible immediately. And here we can see the networks, the names of all the networks. So we will be, of course, attacking our special test network here. It's called Danger. Um, and this is the address and the channel 7. So I'm going to use this information as an attacker to actually gather some data on this specific network. I will now command the computer to write down the cryptographic information that's being used in the network. Channel is 7. That's like a radio channel, channel number 7. And the specific network, even though as an attacker I could do that for all networks, but I'm doing it just for the test network so that uh, everyone else is safe. And here I can see data already coming in. But I have no key, because no one is connecting to the network. You're just using it. As an attacker, I can actually force your device to reconnect to the network, and I will get the cryptographic information that I need. So while I have this running here, I will uh, ask my computer to tell the internet provider that you actually want to disconnect from the network, even though you do not want to do that. And your device will get disconnected. And afterwards, it will automatically try to reconnect, of course. Most of them will. So I will try to do it uh, five, five times, just for good measure. And now I'm sending this information um, to, to the air, to the radio. What happened here, meanwhile? Here we actually. This thing appeared here. We captured a handshake. That is the cryptographic information that we wanted. And it contains everything we need to find out what the password is. I can safely shut this down now. I can go away from the coffee shop. I can go, for example, to my server room. Or I can use servers online that have huge processing capability. And I can upload these small files here, which are only uh, half a megabyte of size online and use those resources to crack the password. But I'm going to do that right here on this device. It's, a, it's an old laptop. It's actually super slow. It's a word list. A word list is a list of passwords, a list of popular passwords that people sometimes use. This specific word list here um, has a lot of stuff in it. OK, I'm trying to count the lines in it. Um, so it has 14 million passwords in it. Let's try to crack it. Maybe one of the passwords will match. So this is how it looks. And it's a small, uh, it's, it's a weak laptop. It only tries 1,000 passwords per second. This laptop here, it can do five, five times as much. It can do 5,000 passwords per second. And here we were lucky. And we only went through some of the file, even though it would have taken three hours to go through all of it. And we found the password that we didn't know before as an attacker to this network. Uh, here it is. It's a name of a band that was once very popular. As an attacker, I can now try to decrypt what the people are doing on that network, what you're browsing over there. I will launch a special program that is used for looking at the network traffic. 
and I will configure this program with this password that I got. And it will be able to decrypt the data that you use. So I will go to the wireless protocol, and I will uh, put the key, key in here that I just found, right? And the name of the network, we saw that too. It was uh, danger do not connect. OK. Now that I have it, I will listen to what's happening in there. Now, I get nothing, once again, because the clients, the users, are already connected. But I can once again force them to disconnect to actually provide me with the cryptographic keys that I need. I will use the same command that I used earlier. That's the address of the Wi-Fi network that we are testing. We don't want to disrupt any legitimate Wi-Fi traffic here, of course. And now we will try to disconnect everyone once again. It's disconnecting there in the background. And there we have it. We have packets, right? I will just specify it so that we do not see any, any information from the unencrypted network uh, right here, that we only use this network here. Attacker wouldn't do that, of course. They would grab all the information they can. OK, so these are the data packets actually unencrypted going through the network. And uh, we have some people here who have uh, agreed to participate in the experiment. And they actually connected their own devices to this network. And uh, thank you very much for that. And all your information is here. And that information is here, too. Let's start with this device here. So let's say you want to um, type in a password somewhere, right? So you would request a web page. And uh, then you would type in your password in the, on the login screen. Meanwhile, let's take a look. Do we actually have information about some web pages? Oh, that's a lot. That's a lot. If you look on the, on the very right here, or actually let me, let me display it here. It may be better. If we look at the very bottom of attacker's screen, um, we can see the domain names being requested right here. And if we go through the packets we have captured, we can see all different. Oh, someone is using, uh, someone from Elcock has apparently also connected this network. So hqelcogroup.com is being requested. We can see all the domain names that your devices are requesting while connected to this network that we just hacked. Uh, wow, that's a bit slow, but uh, let's try to type something in here. Okay. Oh, that worked. So we logged in. Let's take a look and see if we can find the password here. Okay. We, have, we can see what's, what is being browsed online, of course, here. And we can see um, the requests that your computer or your phone sends to the servers. So if you take a look right here, we should be able to dig deeper. and request only the requests where your device actually sends something. OK. We have a couple of those. So these two are from this device here. And if we scroll down, as an attacker, we can see that some data was sent. And at the very bottom here, we can see the username and the password that was used by our victim. Uh, we also have something else from one of the participants um, in, in the audience here. Let's take a look at that. So some data is being posted. It seems it's binary, unfortunately. But attacker can, of course, oh, some key. That's interesting. Attacker can, of course, take this data and export it to the file system somewhere to analyze later and try to decode what it is. So that's the basic attack on a Wi-Fi. We found the password, even though we didn't know it. 
and we also connected to the network and took a look at what everyone else is sending. So now let's continue with some of the tips. So this specific attack, the easiest and most surefire way to protect against it is using a VPN. If you would have been using a virtual private network, all the data would stay encrypted. HTTPS helps as well. But HTTPS is a bit hard for a user. I'm not going to ask you to raise your hands, because uh, it's a bit embarrassing. But uh, some of you may have clicked connect anyway when presented with a screen saying this page is not secure. Because you're, you're, you, you have this business trip, and you have these emails that you really need to get to, and then you have this error popping up. So do you want to connect or not? Of course you want to connect, because you need your email, and an attacker is listening in. So SSL helps, HTTPS helps, but it's not as good as using VPN. <laughs> Let's continue on to some other cyber hygiene tips that do not have anything to do with Wi-Fi in particular, but they will that will help your business by making sure that your people are doing secure processes, implementing secure processes. Before traveling, you should encrypt your devices. Maybe you can consider encrypting your devices even right now, even if you are not traveling anywhere. If you do that, an attacker steals your device, they cannot access your data. If you combine that with backups, you can get access to your data if the device is stolen. An attacker cannot get access to your data. So it's the best option, right? Because a computer costs uh, 1,000 euros. Its uh, data is much more important. That's why you should encrypt and backup your devices. <laughs> you should use strong passphrases where possible. So passphrases are passwords that consist of multiple words. Many information systems, many web pages nowadays, will support a space bar in a password. And it's easy to remember, and it's long enough for a computer to be hard to guess. Never share your toothbrush. I mean, never share your passwords, same as a toothbrush. It's yours and only yours. If your colleague needs to access your resource, talk to the administrator, ask them to create a new account for them. Also, do not reuse old passwords. If your system asks you to change a password, do not just type one in the end of the old password, or do not just try to sneak in the same old password. It is not secure, because in the long term, attackers may have found out your password, and they will try all the combinations that you will try. Similarly, do not share passwords between systems. Online systems often get hacked. We've heard of uh, uh, Twitter leaking passwords. We've heard of uh, Yahoo. We've heard of Hotmail back in the past. And if you use similar passwords between systems, attackers that get access to this leak with your password will be able to use it to log into your corporate systems. <laughs> and always change the default, default passwords and codes. I know that at least one mobile operator here in Latvia uh, ships SIM cards with pin code 0000, all of them. Other operators use a random pin code. So if you get the SIM card with 0000, and you lose it, and someone finds it on the street, and they see the logo, OK. I, I always go, oh, yeah, I can, I can use this. I can log in there, take a look at the address book if it's stored on there. It also applies to different devices, uh, your, your work passwords. If your IT gives you a password, change it. It's usually enforced. But if not, change it, because only you should be the one knowing your passwords. Do not tell your password to anyone, never. Next tip here is employing a firewall. Make sure that your device has a firewall installed. It's very useful. Uh, back, back when Windows uh, XP came out, oh, that was a long time ago. But anyway, when Windows XP came out, it came with a huge hole, huge security hole. And this hole was discovered in a couple of years. And what it meant afterwards, if you installed a fresh Windows XP laptop or desktop and connected it directly to the internet without a firewall, it took around 5 to 10 seconds to get infected. Because malware had taken over so many Windows XP machines 
that they were trying all the possible IP addresses online to connect to and infect them. And uh, Microsoft was even shipping this service pack number two for Windows XP as a CD drive, or DVD was it, um, that you could physically insert into the computer because you could not, you could not do that uh, online. You couldn't connect Windows XP and press Windows Update. While you download updates, you're already infected. So they shipped the CD. Employing a firewall is important because software and hardware will have bugs. It will have problems. And firewall is one of the layers that can, cal that, that, that can help to stop the attacker. You should also try and use an antivirus. Antivirus is a bit less relevant these days than it was before. But still, its heuristic functionalities are quite useful. I mean, there are so many different strands and, and uh, subtypes of viruses these days. Uh, they go in millions. There are poly polymorphic viruses which change their code every time they go to a different machine to infect it. So that part of antivirus is not that important nowadays. But it has this logic. You can call it uh, artificial intelligence, if you like, that tries to look for suspicious programs that do suspicious things. And it will actually try and stop it. Many antivirus also include plugins for web browsers. Um, I actually did a training on Monday for, uh, for some students. And uh, we, were, we were taking a look at how phishing looks like. Phishing is when someone sends you a web page that looks like a legitimate web page, but isn't. It's owned by the attacker and want your credentials. So we downloaded, uh, we downloaded some pages from the internet where people are requested to log in. And we then created a phishing page for that and used an attack. Um, students did that on, on one another in the classroom. And some of them worked, but some of them didn't. Some, some people decided to download the Google login page, accountsgoogle.com, and the antivirus actually understood that it's a Google login page and it's not on the right address and blocked the request. So it's a useful tool. You should also lock your device before leaving it unattended. It's very important, especially if you use disk encryption. If your device is encrypted and you leave it unlocked, anyone can come to it, grab it, and just access all your data. Furthermore, you should always shut down your device entirely if you leave the building or while traveling. So let's say you have uh, locked and suspended your device, put it to sleep, and put it in uh, your bag. And now you are, you're traveling from one city to another by train. If someone steals your bag, and even though the device is locked and suspended, it's possible that the keys to decrypt your stuff is still in the memory, and then can use some advanced techniques to actually access those keys. So when leaving your computer away for long term, or when traveling, you should always shut down the device, not suspend or hibernate it. You should also be vigilant against unsolicited emails. If you get an email, that's a bit strange, and I get those a lot, uh, but I'm very paranoid in that way. Um, then try to take a look at what the email is, try to call the person, especially take care when working with attachments. And when calling the person back and, and checking, have you actually sent me that, uh, that payment right now? It seems a bit suspicious. Um, use the phone number in your phone, not the one in the email. OK? Free flash drive. Conferences love to give out free flash drives. Well, um, flash drives can, can be really nefarious. In our testing for clients, when we try to see if client is secure or not, if a company is secure or not, we actually use a flash drive drop attack or USB drop attack. When we drop around some flash drives around, around their office and see if someone will plug it in. And if they do, some malware gets installed and we get notification. It's, of course, banana malware. We remove it after the test is done. But we get notification that someone could have been infected, that they took the flash drive out. What if the flash drive has your company's logo? Or if your Elko's partner has Elko's logo? Well, maybe I made the flash drive. I can download the logo. I can, I can uh, print it on the flash drive. So my rule, my personal rule is that I avoid free flash drives. And if I find a flash drive somewhere, I also do not plug it into my actual computers. I have test computers for that. And your IT department should also be able to help you with that. They should also have a computer like that. And finally, I would be very reluctant to post personal or work-related details um, on social media. If we talk about 
um, some of the military things that have been happening uh, around, around the geographical area, some of the geopolitical happenings. Um, during the first years of the Ukraine conflict, we actually saw soldiers posting their uh, locations on social media. Well, maybe not directly, but as metadata. When you use your phone to take a picture, it stores the location where you took the picture inside the file. And if you upload it, sometimes the data is left in there. You can also, landmarks also were used in, in, in that sense. For example, Facebook actually removes the data before publishing the photo. But landmarks can be used um, to locate someone. Of course, in our business, it's not important to hide where we are. But it may be important to hide who some of our partners are, how much have we agreed, what's the price level we agreed to on, on some partner. And posting some information uh, online may actually reveal that. There was this one case of, uh, of a friend I have, a British guy. He was in the British Navy. And uh, um, he was climbing up the ranks really fast. So the PR office of, uh, of the Navy decided to congratulate him. And they posted a post on their web page saying that this gentleman um, has been on the ship for three years now, and they're fighting pirates in that location. Here's his picture. And then his friend posted under that picture Oh, great to see that you're, you're still here. Let's meet at this bar at this location at this hour. Of course, he had to cancel the meeting. But these things, these things happen, and even small pieces of information can be combined together to give your adversary the big picture. So be cautious about social media. Those are the tips I had for you today. Thank you very much. So maybe someone has uh, any questions? Okay. Uh, thanks, Kirill, for the presentation. I have just one quick question. Uh, what is the easiest, easiest way how to encrypt your machine, uh, phone, or co personal computer? Um, well, Microsoft, if you use Microsoft, they provide uh, encryption capabilities in the operating system. That's one. Um, where a crypt is a more professional one, so that's uh, V-E-R-A, crypt. It's a fork of true crypt. So that's a more, more secure level. But uh, Microsoft one is fine. OK, thanks. And while we look for the next question, uh, you can actually also encrypt individual files or just one user. But of course, it's, uh, it's best to encrypt the whole hard drive. If I'm traveling abroad and I have to make payment, um, then is it uh, safer to connect by um, uh, mobile data? It is, it is a bit safer because it's a bit harder to hack it. But it's still relatively easy. I mean, I could have prepared a demo for that, and it would have taken uh, maybe five minutes more to intercept mobile data. Um, what is important is when you know, when you're aware that you're doing a high-risk transaction, like going on an internet bank, you should be very, very careful. If you get a warning, do not do the transaction. Do not, do not say yes. Look, at, look if you have encryption, actually. You have to be mentally, it's, a, it's hard work. You have to mentally look at everything you're doing and check that it's secure. But if you have a VPN, it makes things a lot easier. Because wherever you are, to the attacker, you actually don't see anything. And to the bank, you appear as coming from your company, for example. If it's your company's VPN, they think you're in the company's office. So, Everything between where you are and the company's office is fully encrypted. So VPN is the best solution, uh, even, even when using mobile data. Does anyone uh, else has uh, any questions? I have one. Uh, what is like the funniest uh, hack that you have uh, done maybe on your friends just to mess <laughs> around? <clears throat> um, well, I can, I can tell you how much. Do we have like three minutes? Yeah. Yeah? OK. Seven. Oh, great. Um, I can tell you a story of how I got into IT security. Uh, well, how I got into system administration and then IT security. So I was, um, I was in seventh grade, I think, uh, real young. It, it's 13 years, maybe, um, 13 years of age. And uh, I just changed schools because my school only, uh, was only available until grade six. So I went to a new school. 
And of course, there are, we, we have classmates, we have teachers, right? Uh, and sometimes you don't like a teacher. So I really hated one teacher. So I decided I need to get that teacher in trouble. So what I did was I actually, I, I didn't even have internet at home back then. Uh, nowadays, ki kids of age 13, 14 have internet. Back then it was, you know, usually we had to wait until internet was, was available in the region, right? So I went to my, uh, my neighbor who had internet. And one of the first things I learned about, uh, about how internet works is actually that email protocol is very insecure. It's basically the same as an envelope. If you send a regular mail by post, someone probably has done that recently, right, or a card, and you, you type in who you send it to, and you type in your address. SMTP, or email protocol, is just the same. You can also type whatever address you want as a return address. So what I did, I sent, um, I sent a really bad email to the IT teacher from the teacher that I didn't like, kind of fr from her, right? And well, they found me somehow. Apparently, back then, we didn't have GDPR. And the teacher was really good. So she said, uh, sh she called me up and, and finally explained to me what happened. Uh, they called, of course, IP address was added to the email. Uh, they called up the internet service provider. And this internet service provider just gave the home address of the IP address. But it wasn't mine. It was my neighbor's. Then they looked at the pupil registry. And, and of course, the only one living in approximately the same area was me. And that's how, that's how they fi found me. And that's how they said, well, OK, come on. You, you know some things. Why don't you come help us? Why don't you s help administrating network servers? And that's how I started with, that's how I went from, from programming to actual networking. And then a um, couple, well, a lot of years later into IT security. Are people uh, scared from your skills? <laughs> I hope not. <laughs> well, uh, I think they are, yes. Uh, I think they are. Uh, we were doing a training, uh, me, me personally, I, I was there doing the training for, for a company, and I told them, uh, by the way, one of the things you should be aware of is physical security. So you have your keys, and then you have your badges, which you can, uh, which you can uh, bring to your door, and the door opens up. And those can be usually easily copied. So a guy stands up immediately in the audience, oh, come on, I have my work badge right here. Let's see if you can copy it. Oh, we're at, at, at their workplace doing training. And uh, I'm showing them device that can copy the badges. And yeah, we, we copied it. He went to check the door. He, he came back a bit shaken and sad, saying, yeah, it worked. Uh, and, and, and then everybody was really quiet for, for, the rest, for the rest of the training until lunch. So sometimes people do get scared. But that's, that's one of the tasks of my job, to actually scare people at first as they listen and then try to tell them how to, how to make things better. Uh, on the Elko Meetup app, there was written about you that you are the most visible white hat hacker. What does it actually mean? And that's the last question. Yes, so, so uh, well, hackers actually aren't bad people. Hackers are simply people with a particular set of skills. And you can be black hat, someone who's doing bad stuff like I did when I was 13. Or you can be white hat, someone who's doing good things. Well, and uh, I do talk a lot about what I do about the hacks that I can do. I, 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 I love to talk about them. So if you want, I can, I can do that for you. And uh, well, that's how, that's how I got to be. Uh, got to be the most visible white hat hacker in Latvia. OK, so thank you, Kirill. Uh, Thanks. I think it was useful, right? Maybe some applause. <laughs>